Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're looking at some additional issues that I've seen brought up in various comments, replies, and requests, but which I haven't already done videos on. Last time, we talked about whether and how much the church can be corrupted, and this time, who made us subject to futility. This issue comes from Romans 8.20, a difficult verse to interpret at face value, which reads, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject, in hope. Romans 8.20 At first blush, this verse is difficult to swallow, since it doesn't include any specifics about who is responsible for this horrible state of affairs. Nearly every clue contained in this verse is ambiguous, because neither the phrase not willingly, nor the phrase in hope, are necessarily being applied to the one who subjected us to vanity, i.e. futility. The phrase, the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, could easily mean that creatures weren't willing to be subjected to futility. A bit obvious as statements go, but not impossible. Meanwhile, the phrase in hope could easily refer to the next verse, which continues in hope, because the creature also itself shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. Romans 8.21 In short, creatures have hope that they can escape corruption one day, so none of the descriptive terms in this verse can be associated with the one responsible with any degree of certainty. Because of this, we can't use them to refute any of the theories about who this phantom person is and why they did this. However, there are in general three individuals who are considered to be possible answers to this question. The first is Adam, whose sin brought about this state of affairs. The second is Satan, who, through tempting Eve, encouraged Adam to do this thing. The third is God, who Adam fell away from when this state of affairs began. As things stand, I don't think we can say with certainty which of these theories is correct, but there is one word in Romans 8.20 that I think might be meant to give us a clue. The word reason. By reason of him that made it subject. Whoever subjected mankind to futility did so for a reason of some kind. Other translations use the term will, implying that this subjection was intended. The Latin uses the word propter, which means something like because of, again, implying some reason. It's not much to go on, but let's see where it leads us. Adam seems to be the least likely candidate of the three major ones. Well, he may have known what the consequences of his actions would be, the jury's still out on that, he had no reason for mankind to struggle in futility for dozens if not hundreds of generations, nor, as far as we can tell, was that his will. It's more likely that he just gave in to peer pressure, as people often do. Everything that God does, he does for a reason, and it could be that since mankind had sinned, the best course of action he could take, which would result in the most people being saved, involved an awful lot of futility, so that people would realize their need for him. The only obstacle to this theory is that we know that God doesn't will evil things, though he could still will for the good that comes about through the evil to happen without necessarily willing the evil itself. The Bible doesn't overtly tell us Satan's reason for injuring mankind in this way. He had nothing to gain from doing so, but he may have been after revenge against God or some such thing, which could be considered a reason after a fashion, he was by far the most willing to have evil things happen to mankind out of the three. However, he was also the least directly involved in the first sin. Adam was the sinner, and God the one being sinned against. Satan's role was only to egg Adam's wife on, a horrible crime to be sure, but it was really the sin of Adam that was responsible for the fall, not the sin of Satan. As I said, I still can't be entirely sure who it is that St. Paul is referring to in this passage. Again, there are things in his letters that are hard to understand. However, I think it's most likely that St. Paul is trying to refer to the role of God in the fall, but without actually implying that God is responsible for evil. You see, God doesn't cause evil directly, but he does cause harm in the same way that cliffs cause car wrecks. The cliff has no malice against your car. It's not cruel, and it's made no decision to hurt you. If you drive off the cliff, however, you can't expect it to hurt any less for all of that. In the same way, God holds no hostility to people and doesn't set out to cause them harm. However, if you sin against him, certain things follow from that, 
which aren't necessarily pleasant. St. Paul doesn't spell any of this out in these verses. It's possible that he might not understand it all. However, it is one possible explanation for what this verse could mean, and I think is the most likely one. God can cause things to happen that we won't like in the short term, but which aren't evil things as such, because there's more to them than just the parts of them that we see in the here and now. Next, what's the problem with Lutheranism? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.